There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, aboran, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, bromine, lithium, beryllium, and barium. Before I start going a bit more into this dot point, I quickly want to talk about what pressure actually is, because often pressure sounds kind of straightforward, what actually pressure means, but pressure has a chemi chemical or chemistry definition as well. And the definition of pressure is how often a particle hits the wall of a container and how much energy that particle hits the wall of the container. So how often and with how much energy. I'll quickly go over what that means. So for example, you have your, this is your container here, right? Your walls are here. These are your walls of your container. And inside you have your particles. Now these particles, if you have lots of space, that means they're going to, you know, the chance of them hitting would be maybe lower than if the space was less, right? But pressure itself is how often, right? So here now it's hitting quite often, the actual size of the container. Whereas if it hits slower, and it hits less often, but not only how often, but how forcefully it hits as well, right? So if it has lots of energy, it's going to hit it, and it's going to apply lots of pressure, uh, lots of yeah, pressure, and then the pressure itself increases. So pressure is all about how often particles hit, and how much energy they have when they hit. Right? So that's what that's what pressure is. And what? How does temperature affect pressure? That's also important. Remember, what is temperature? Temperature is the average amount of energy a particle possesses. And I said that energy is important because if one of these particles hits, if it has more energy, that means it's going to cause more pressure as well. So obviously, if we increase our temperature, since temperature is basically how much energy one has, if we increase our temperature, that also means we're going to be increasing pressure. Because what that means when we're increasing temperature, it means we're going to make it go faster. And we're going to give it more energy. So it means if it's, go far, if it's going faster, it means there's a more of a chance of it hitting the actual sides of the container, which means we've increased the actual pressure. Same thing, well, the reverse happens when we decrease the temperature. They're going to go slower. They're going to have less energy, which means there's going to be a decrease in pressure. Right? So that's how temperature and pressure are connected. Now, what happens? So how does the concentration of particles affect pressure? Let's say, for example, I were to double those, right? So double them or even triple them. Let's say we have increased the concentration threefold. Uh, if I just use one, right? you can imagine this one is going to hit maybe, let's say, one or twice a second. But if there are, if I have so many more, that means that's going to happen for each and every one of them. So if you have more particles, they're generally going to hit more often. Right? So the more particles we have, the more pressure there is, because overall, this is going to happen for every single one. So they're going to start hitting the container. So the less space you have, the more pressure you have. So by increasing the concentration, so an increase of the concentration of particles inside a container means an increase of pressure. And if we have a decrease in the concentration, we'll have a decrease in pressure, because if we have less stuff in there, less of it is going to hit the actual wall. Right, so that was just an sort of introduction to pressure. The reason why I need to know that is because stop point itself says analyze the impact of increased pressure on a system involved in the harbor process. So what will it mean if we increase our pressure on the system of the harbor process? And that's what we're going to discuss here. So again, I've got the same kind of idea, and we've got the harbor process here, which is making from hydrogen gas and hydrogen gas making ammonia and it's also an exothermic reaction but if you rem can remember I said that we use about tw 20 milli um, amperes sorry millipascal of pressure which equals to the same as saying 200 atmospheric pressure right I'm giving both because some books use atmospheric pressure some use millipascal but on average, different plants will have different pressures, but it's going to be roughly this pressure. Right? So roughly 20 milliampers and roughly or 200 atmospheric pressure, both the same. So that's what we use in the Haber process. Now, why do we use that pressure? And that's what we're going to talk about. Why do we choose this pressure when it comes to the Haber process? So first of all, when it comes to the Le Chartier's principle, we know that pressure itself 
is affects the equilibrium, right? We want to make the equilibrium go in this direction. We want to make it favor the product because the product is ammonia. We want to increase the ammonia yield. So what happens if we increase the pressure? 200 atmospheric pressure is pretty high, not super, super high, but it's pretty high. So we've increased the pressure. What does it do when it comes to the ammonia yield? Right? So here we have our, at the moment, this is at normal. So this is at sort of normal atmospheric pressure. Normal atmospheric pressure. We have one, two, three, three moles of nitrogen gas, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine moles of hydrogen gas, and let's say two moles of ammonia. So we have a one to three ratio of nitrogen to ammonia, as our nitrogen to hydrogen gas, and we also have these two moles of ammonia. Now, what would happen if we increase the pressure? This is a normal. Let's say we increase the pressure, and we can do that by, for example, making a the container smaller. And right? if we make the container smaller, that means we're increasing the pressure because they're going to have a more frequency of hitting the actual container because the container itself is smaller. Now, because this whole thing is in equilibrium, what that means is the actual system wants to reverse any effect. So any, any change in the equilibrium, it wants to be able to reverse. So now we have decreased the pressure. We have decreased, sorry, increased the pressure. I say one thing and then write another thing. Increase the pressure. But the system wants to reverse that. It wants to bring it down again. Because the reversible equilibrium doesn't want to have anything disturbing it. So what can you do to try to reverse the increase in pressure? Well, it can't really make the size of the container any different because that's going to stay the same. But what happens if here we have a total of one mole of nitrogen and three moles of hydrogen. So that's four moles. So four of these particles, whereas if it goes the other direction, it's only two particles because it's two moles of ammonia. So that means this one is going to have less space. It's going to take less space. Remember I said if we have a lower concentration in general of particles, that means there's going to be less pressure. So what's going to try to do is basically going to try to go into the right-hand side, which means it's going to be able to remove by by making the reaction go ahead. So I'm going to remove three of these hydrogen gases, moles of these hydrogen gases, and one of these nitrogen gases, because that's what happens if these react to form two of this. Right. So now two have been formed. And that means we have, overall, we have less particles, which means overall we have less pressure, because there's less particles to hit the wall. So that's what the system does. The system favors, goes, pushes to the right, which means now we have, instead of having two, we had two sort of moles of ammonia beforehand, now we have four. So we've increased the yield of ammonia. So that's all well and good. But if you look at this graph, what this graph shows you is that the more pressure we have, the higher our percentage yield. Right? So if we have, for example, this point here might be, let's say, a thousand atmospheric pressure. So if we have a thousand atmospheric pressure, we will have the highest yield. But if you have a look at this situation, we're not using a thousand; we're using two hundred. But because, so what I mean by you know having more yield is we have still we still have two moles of nitrogen and two six moles of hydrogen, which means theoretically these can react to form another four moles. So we basically convert eight moles, eight particles into four particles. If we have if we change it even more, if we increase the pressure even more make this even smaller, we will have eight particles gone and four new particles, all being ammonia, being there. So we have less space, and that means we have even more ammonia, right? So why don't we do that? Why don't we use a thousand atmospheric pressure? That means we're going to get more ammonia. And this is where this whole dot point comes into play. So it says, analyze the impact of increased pressure on the system involved in the Howard process. So first of all, we need to consider the percentage yield. So for the what this says is the more pressure the better, right? So the more pressure, the better. But we're using roughly sort of 200 atmospheric pressure and not 1,000 atmospheric pressure. And then obviously the question would come and play, why would that be the case? Economic factors are one of the reasons why. If we have high, high pressure, it would cost a lot of money. And the reason why is because we would have to have 
really strong sort of tubes to withstand that pressure. And overall, it's just not economically viable. So that one, of the, one of the reasons why we use 200 atmospheric pressure, not 1,000, is because of the cost. Right? It's a cost too much. And another one is safety. Because if you think about it, if you have 1,000 atmospheric pressure, that's so much pressure that this thing could break and just cause all kinds of havoc. So the safety concern of it breaking and causing damage is also the reason why we use 200 atmospheric and not 1,000 atmospheric. Right, so analyze the impact of increased pressure on the system involved in the power process. We're gonna have we use 200 atmospheric pressure because that means we're gonna still get a higher yield of ammonia than if we have normal atmospheric pressure, right? Because that means we have less space. The system is going to try to counteract that increase in pressure by going to space-saving version, which in this case is these ammonium um, molecules, as opposed to the the other ones because it goes from four molecules in the reactants to two molecules in the products. But at the same time, it's not going to go to the extreme of atmosphere, even though that would be useful for the percentage yield. The reason why is because if we have too much pressure on the system, that would increase our cost to build these really stable uh, tubes and have that high pressure. And also, it would increase the chance of it breaking. Safety concerns are massive. Right? So the 200 atmospheric is like a compromised version it still increases our yield, but it doesn't cost as much and it's safer to use as well. So that's what you should know about the stop point. But hopefully that was useful. Thank you for watching.